series of heroes of faith. And last week we talked about Elijah. And I don't know about you, I, I hope that you agree with me, but I love preaching on, on Elijah. And mainly because I just love the time that I was able to spend in God's word researching his life. I would love to be able to continue talking about Elijah today, but we must press on. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough time to recap each and every single week. But I do want to remind you of this. The main message from last week that we kind of focused on is this. Prayer is powerful in a faithful man. Prayer is powerful in the life of a faithful man. By man, I mean man or woman. But maybe you missed last week's sermon. Maybe you've missed one in the past. Make a point to go on to our website or Facebook and catch the link. We do have our sermons uploaded loaded online to podcast, to SoundCloud or YouTube. And catch up so that you, you know what's going on. The good thing about this series, Heroes of Our Faith, is each week is a different person. So you can come in today and know we're not starting right in the middle of something. You're not missing out on some information that you wish you'd know, you knew. But today we're on a new hero. And today's hero may be one which you don't think of very often. Because I think that most of us, or at least myself, and I think you'd, you would include yourself as well, when we think of our hero, we often think of one specific type of hero. We think of heroes being people who fight a battle, lift up a sword. They go up in, against an incredible foe with an incredible army. But heroes can often be everyday people that maybe you look to as regular people like you and I. But often we think of people like Elijah from last week. We think of people like Moses, who led the thousands, the millions of people in Exodus. We think of Samson, and we think of David. But there are so many everyday people, and today we're looking at Ruth. Now, you're welcome to start to open to Ruth 1 as I talk. But today we're looking to Ruth, a hero of faith, a faithful friend. Ruth's name is said to mean just that. We talked last week a little bit about what do names mean. And Elijah's name meant the Lord is God. And that's what his entire life represented is the Lord is God. Well, today we're talking about Ruth. And Ruth's name means friend. And in Ruth, we have four short chapters. One book was a huge impact to our faith. Only two Old Testaments have a name after a woman. And that would be Ruth and Esther. The Old Testament does not mention the name of Ruth again. It's only in the book of Ruth. But it is mentioned one time in the New Testament. And we'll get to that later on in the sermon. Again, Ruth has a huge impact. Despite the fact that it's only mentioned in this book, in one spot in the New Testament, it's a story of life and death, feast and famine, love and loss. And love regained. So, <coughs> excuse me, if, if you could please stand with your Bibles open. And I will have the scripture on the screen here for you to follow along with as well. I'm going to read Ruth 1. And then we'll move on with the message today. Starting at verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Sounds familiar, right? And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Aphrodites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons. The woman, Naomi, was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she, then she arose with her daughter-in-laws to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had returned, visited his people, and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughter-in-laws, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. 
The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Now return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts from me, from you. And when Naomi saw that she, go back, <laughs> and when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who, who returned from the country of Moab. You may be seated. <coughs> Thank you. So as we look to a new hero, maybe a new type of hero for you, a new type of hero for me, because again, we like to think of these heroes being the sword-welding heroes of the Bible, the heroes that made magnificent miracles come to be, such as famines, as we talked about with Elijah last week. I want us to look to a few key interests, a key, few key points to this woman's life, Ruth. A few points that will also give us in our own life a lesson on how we should be living in faith. The main theme for this message is this. God uses a faithful friend for an extraordinary purpose. Ruth. Now, I try and always make these themes, this main point for you to remember, wrote out in a way which it's not just for Ruth. It's something you can apply to your life as well. So I want you to remember this. If you're taking notes, write this down. God uses a faithful friend for an extraordinary purpose. This can also be you. As a faithful friend, God can use you for an extraordinary purpose, for his purpose. Now, you do not need to be an extraordinary person to be used in God's plan. You just need to be a person with faith in God. Now, number one in our message today is this. God uses common cleansed people. I feel somebody in here needs to hear that today. God uses common, cleansed people. God wants to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things through them. But do we really seek God? Are we seeking his will or are we only seeking our own will? Do our lives really show that God exists? There was a quote I said last week, which was this. Do you say you believe yet you live as if he does not exist. Do you say you believe, yet you continue to depend on your own power instead of depending on his divine power? God wants more than your Sunday mornings. He wants your life, your whole life. Have you given him your whole life? And for the longest time, I struggled with this. I really thought, I'm not good enough to be used by God. Why would God want to use a person like me? But then a couple of things happened. Number one is this. I looked to God and I realized that it did not matter who I was. It wasn't how good I was, how bad I was. It wasn't truly about me. It's about God. I just needed to have faith in him. 
trust in God, trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and follow His will for my life. And then number two, I started looking to God's Word and the people around me. Have you ever noticed how we have a way of putting other people on a pedestal and thinking, these people are so great, I wish I was like them. We talked a little bit about that with the life of Elijah. We were, we were applying it to prayer life. Well, here we're just putting it into a general concept here. And here's what I found. I found that everyone is like me. Everyone is like you. We all have our problems. And even when we apply this to the books of the Bible, to characters of the Bible, we have Moses, who was not good with his words, and he was a murderer. We have Rahab, who was a harlot. We have Jonah, a rebel, a runner. And we recently were in that book and studied that. We have Sarah, who is a doubter. We have Peter. We get the point. We have all these characters of the Bible. We have Samson, David, Esther, Jacob. All these characters of the Bible who we seem to hold to a high standard and think, these were heroes, and I just wish our lives were more like theirs. But it's also good for us to remember that they were ordinary people who God used. And it was because of God's extraordinary powers that they did extraordinary things. We need to realize we are ordinary. But that's not a problem if we remember that our God is extraordinary. We all have problems. The Bible tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. And it's only because of Jesus cleansing our sins that we are seen as new creations worthy of a redeemed relationship with God. God's love and strength is what saves us, but it is also what carries us on and is what's it, what delivers us to be able to accomplish his will from day to day. It's not about us. It's about God. Tony Evans said this in a book I was reading on unlikely heroes that God uses. Despite your own failures or fumbles... God has the, the ability and even the desire to turn your situation from gloom to bloom. God, in fact, delights in using imperfect people who have failed, sinned, or just plain blown it to accomplish his will. Now, there's many reasons we could talk about with that. I'm not going to focus a lot of time on this quote, but I do want to say I love a few things about this. I love that he talks gloom to bloom. And if you've ever heard Tony Evans talk, he's a black man out of Texas, and he just has this great, booming voice. And, you know, in fact, one reason why I was drawn to Tony Evans, too, besides his face and his beliefs, is he also has a speech problem like me. And he was another illustration to me of somebody that God can use despite his speech problem, despite my speech problem. God can still use us if we go to God with a faithful attitude and we depend on him. Now, something else I love about this, that second part. God, in fact, delights in using imperfect people. He loves to use imperfect people. Look how he uses me. Look how he uses all of us. He delights in using us. And I think one reason for that is he wants somebody who's going to wow everybody around him. Now, don't take that in a bad way. I don't mean it to sound like you are all terrible people. And God's going to use you just to show, man, look how this terrible person here just did this. But it is also true. It brings even more attention to God when this person's able to do that. So maybe one example is this, just off the top of my head. I can't sing. I love to just lift my voice up to God, and I will sing really loud even though I, I'm not a great singer. But if I just all of a sudden right now... No music behind me, no instruments, just started singing to God. I sounded like some guy on the radio. It would bring a lot more attention to God because it would be a beautiful melody up to him. Maybe it's a man who cannot memorize God's word at all. He has not memorized one word because he struggles with it. And then he walks up here, no Bible. He just puts it down and he just starts speaking from Genesis to Revelation and has the entire thing memorized. It's going to bring all the glory to God because that man's not, he, his strength is not in that. God loves using weak people, failed people, imperfect people because it glorifies him even the more. <clears throat> Maybe you think you are this imperfect person. We all are. God delights and he wants to use you. None are perfect, not one. We are all common people. And that was my point one about Ruth. Ruth was a common person. 
But here's the question. Are you ready to be faithful and to be used for his purpose? Will you allow yourself to become less and God to become more? To live the right way and to treat people, all people, as friends, as family, as family of God. Here in Ruth, we have a great example of how God uses a common person, a faithful friend, to do his work and ultimately to be blessed because of it. And we're going to look to Ruth 1. Here we have a Moabite woman, Ruth. Now a little bit about Moabites here before we go too far into Ruth herself. Ruth was a Moabite. Now remember point one, God uses common people, common cleansed people. Moabites were not particularly liked by God's people in Bethlehem. They had a lot of history. They were distant relatives. But besides that, they were people who do not worship the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, the God of Jacob. They worship false gods themselves. In fact, some of these gods they worship believed that they, they needed to do child sacrifices to these gods. These were some pretty crazy people, and they worshiped some pretty crazy gods. Yet we see in the beginning of chapter 1... What happens? We see that Naomi, her husband, and her two sons left Bethlehem, the Bethlehem area, and they went to Moab. Now, Moab's not a particularly special place. We just covered that. Mo Moab's not a great place. But for some reason, Naomi and her husband and her two sons, they go to Moab. Now, why would they be doing this? As we read God's word, we need to look for key things, and we need to ask those questions like why, who, what, when, where, how. We need to really de decipher what is God trying to tell us here, and these little details mean a lot. So as we look, we see that there is a great famine in the Bethlehem area, and as we talk about famines, I want to also just note last week we talked about a famine. This is a different famine. There's actually quite a bit of famines in the Bible. Now I kind of wish I would have looked up how many there were. But it happens quite a bit in the Bible. But this is a different famine from the days of Elijah. We're not told if this is another godly judgment or if it's just a regular weather pattern. But what we do know, yeah, there's, a, there's a famine. And this famine drives this family out of Moab, out of Bethlehem, to go to Moab to find a place that they can farm and they can make a new life for themselves. Moab, just a little info, is about 75 miles away. Now maybe 75 miles doesn't sound like a lot to you today. You can drive 75 miles in about an hour. If you do 75 miles per hour on Highway 53, I do. Um, but in that day, 75 miles would be a long walk. About 7 to 10 days is one commentary that I read, and I think seven to ten days for that walk sounds very good because I've done some backpacking trips through mountains and through hills, and that's a lot to walk, especially if you have a lot of belongings with you. Now, they get to Moab, and what do we see happen? We see Naomi's husband dies. We're told then that, the, that Naomi's two sons marry Moabite wives. Again, Moabite people are not considered good Ab, uh, good, ordinary, extraordinary people by God's people. M Moabites were considered bad people by all use of the word. They lived there for 10 years before what happens now. <clears throat> Naomi's two sons now also die. And Ruth and Orpah are left without husbands themselves as well. So just to recap, they move to Moab. Naomi's husband dies. The two sons marry Moabite wives. And now the two sons die as well. Now it's just Naomi left with her two daughters. Now there's a lot in these two chapters of Ruth, in, in these four chapters of Ruth, but we're focusing just on chapter one. The relationship between Naomi and Ruth and Ruth's faith, specifically her being a faithful friend. And now with Naomi having no husband, no sons, no grandsons to speak of, Naomi decides that it's time to go back home to Bethlehem because as she's working in the field, she hears the people of the field talking about God has returned and brought food back to the land. We're not given the details on why all three of these men die. But I think we can look at the end result and we can see that these three men dying is what ultimately led Naomi and Ruth back to Bethlehem and back into a process, a plan 
which would put them on God's will, to do God's purpose. Ruth has no idea what she's about to be blessed with. She's just a faithful friend who's not going to take no for an answer. So after all three husbands are dead, Naomi goes to Ruth and Orpah, and she releases them from any commitment to her. <clears throat> now this is big. So Ruth and Orpah did not like this, really. In fact, as we read this, we read, and we see that they both cried out. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, of you as you have dealt with the dead with me. You've been through a lot with me. You've dealt with my, my, all this death of my husband and your two husbands. May the Lord deal kindly with you for going through all of this with me. But you're now released. Go back to your own families. Find a future for yourself. Don't continue to be with me and to be cursed, live a cursed life. Because Naomi believes, and as you read on, she believes that she's being cursed by God. She's, she's going to live a life of cursing by God for some, something. The, glor the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lift up their voices and wept. The two daughter-in-laws, they didn't like this news. They were sad. They didn't want to leave Naomi. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. So at first glance, I want you to see, because a lot of people think that Orpah is a bad person here, an evil person here. I can't believe Orpah left her behind. But really what we see is she wanted to go with her as well to begin with. But no, Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my room that they may become your husbands? Now, Naomi's telling them, don't stay with me. There's no future with me. If you stay with me, you're never going to marry again. You're never going to have children again. And it still brought them great, great tears, and they cry out. It's important to notice also that in that scripture, Naomi's telling them, go back to your family. Go back to your gods. Naomi knew that they had something to live for here. Naomi didn't know what her future would, would be. And this moves us to the next point. Point number two is this. As we think about Ruth, and as we think of your life, again, I try and write these in a way which you can apply them to your, your life personally. God uses courageous, cautious people. Now, maybe that seems kind of backwards. God uses courageous, cautious people. I did that on purpose because what I mean is God can use all people. And there is a balance there that you need to be courageous. You need to be brave, but you also need to be cautious. You can't just go running straight into the fire. I think about the Civil War days and the Revolutionary War days I've seen movies of, and they were just marching a line right against the other, the other um, army who's also in the line. They would just start shooting at each other. They, just, they weren't cautious at all. And we started winning the, the war when we learned to start hiding behind trees and kneeling down. We can be courageous and cautious at the same time. And I think God creates this perfect balance for a reason. But here we have the two daughter-in-laws, both being given instructions to go home. And yet we see two different things. We see Ruth stays with Naomi. <coughs> and Orpah decides to leave. Orpah gives her a kiss and cries out and leaves her side. Ruth was brave. Now I'm not saying that Orpah wasn't brave. It also takes bravery to tell somebody no and, or to agree with that will. And sometimes we do need to be brave enough to tell somebody, you know what, I just can't do this right now. I've got too much on the plate. I need to focus on, on my God. I need to focus on my family. And I need to get things straight there before I start helping you with your family. Sometimes we overly commit ourselves. And that's not part of this sermon on Ruth, but it is a good point for you to remember. Here we see Ruth was brave. She doesn't take the easy way out. Now, remember, earlier I told you that Moab was 75 miles from Bethlehem. Moab was 75 miles from Bethlehem, roughly. But add these details into this. <coughs> Ruth chooses to stay with Naomi despite the release of the responsibilities. And as she stays with Naomi, here's what this journey would entail. 75 miles descending 4,500 feet into the Jordan Valley, and then ascending 3,750 feet through the hills of Judea, <coughs> alone. Or possibly alone. 
as we see that all God's word tells us there, is that two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. <coughs> Ruth was let go. And yet Ruth decided to stay with her, to stay by her side. And in fact, I find it quite strong as we read Ruth's words back to her. But allow me to remind you again. Ruth is a Moabite. She's already in her home country. She's probably just a few miles from her, from her mom, from her dad, from their property, from all the people she grew up with. She could have easily taken the, the easy way out and said, okay, mom, mom-in-law, thanks, I'm, I'm going to leave, I'm, bye, see you later. But no, she decided to stay by Ruth's side, and she's saying, I'm not letting you go back on this long, hard trip alone. There could be muggers, robbers, thieves, murderers along the way. This is going to be a long, hard journey. I will stay by your side. I will fulfill my responsibilities to you as your daughter. And she is persistent on staying with Naomi, despite any consequences. So Naomi now warns them, there will be no husband. I mean, more or less, she's saying, you stay with me. Chances are very slim of any husband, especially coming from me. No future children. It will be a hard life. <coughs> Orpah chooses to remain in Moab. An interesting fact for you. The name of Orpah means stubborn. Now, I find that funny because I think Orpah is not necessarily the stubborn one here. It's Ruth. Be and it maybe it depends on how you look at this. But Orpah is not being stubborn. She actually does what she's told to do. In some ways, Orpah gives us another good characteristic of a good friend, and she's obedient. She's doing as her mother-in-law is commanding her to do. Go home. Okay, bye, kiss, goodbye. But we have Ruth, on the other hand, who says no. She's being disobedient, but it's for a good cause. <coughs> Ruth was stubborn and would not leave Naomi's side, but it's all part of God's plan. And as we read on, we see Ruth's actual response to Naomi. And I love this because she's so passionate about what she's going to do. And she said, Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Ruth is a faithful friend, and Ruth has such a strong argument there. Ruth is so passionate about her belief that she's not going to leave her side, that Naomi chooses not even to speak back. She just says, okay, thank you. Sometimes we need to learn from that too, and we need to know when it's time to just say, okay, thank you. Sometimes we can be more disrespectful to somebody by not allowing them to bless us and be faithful to us than the opposite. Ruth is not only a faithful friend, but she's a loyal daughter-in-law. And she will not leave Naomi to go on this journey despite any consequences she may face. She may be common, but she's also courageous. And if you were to read on, you would also see that she's cautious as she listens to Naomi's advice throughout chapters 2, 3, and 4. And I believe she is also cleansed. So we got point 1 and point 2. We got God uses common, and I added cleansed people in there. And we got God uses courageous, cautious people. I believe she's cleansed. And when I say cleansed, I say I believe she's now a believer. I believe she has committed her life not just to Naomi and to Naomi's family, but she has also committed her life to God. She does not want to go back to her family. She doesn't want to go back to her gods because she's made a commitment to be a believer of the one true God. And she says, your family will be my family. Your God will be my God. And she's not going to leave that commitment. She clung to Ruth. That's a strong word, clung. <clears throat> she held on to her. She grasped her. She clung to her and said, I am not leaving your side. My sister may be kissing you and leaving, but I am not leaving. One last thought on this point of courage. 
it would take great courage for Ruth to do this. Not only is she going to make a long journey when she could stay here, not only is she leaving her family behind, her friends behind, any possibilities of a future marriage and children here behind, but she's also going to be walking into a town of people that hate her kind. Now, we did just give the argument that she no longer believes herself to be of that kind. But still, these people, as she walks into the, to Bethlehem, would see her as a Moabite. And she's going to be courageous and brave and do so anyways. Ruth also was thought to be in her, I'm sorry, Naomi was thought to be in her 50s by now. And Naomi in her late 20s. So this is a hard journey. God uses a faithful friend for his extraordinary purpose. What is this purpose? Well, number one, as we've covered a lot now, is to be a friend. But two, we're going to get to in a moment. <clears throat> as I start to wrap up, I want to ask you this question. I want you to think about it. What is a friend? Or really, what really makes a good friend a good friend? What separates an acquaintance from someone who, re who you really consider a friend. I quizzed a few people this week, both friends and family around here and back home, people at our men's Bible study, and I just asked them, what makes a good friend a good friend? And here are some of the answers I got. Well, loyalty or faithfulness. Now that's one we definitely see here. And they specified this, we all want to be close to people, people who are loyal to us. A friend is trustworthy to keep secrets. And they respect the confidence that you've placed in them. A friend is truthful with you. Now this next, next one I was a little surprised to hear. A friend pushes you. And it's not so much that I was surprised to hear. It made sense. A friend pushes you. But it's how many times I heard it. I heard a lot of people saying that to me. A friend pushes you. And I find it surprising because as I'm a friend to people, I know I at least find it hard to push people. Because that's kind of those awkward conversations that you dread having with people is pointing out, pointing out where you need to challenge somebody and where you need to push them and where you need to say, look, you just need to push on, move past this, or you need to do this or that. Those are the hard things. But a friend pushes you. Here's another answer I got. A true friend is a believer. <clears throat> a friend relates with you. Now, we're not saying you can't have friends that are non-believers, but you can relate more with somebody who is a believer. These are just a few qualities of a good friend, but it makes me ask you this question. How good of a friend are you? How faithful of a friend are you? I believe Ruth was all of those above, especially if you are to read chapters 2, 3, and 4 as well to get the whole picture. She is a hard worker, she is respectful, she is committed, and as you continue to read, you see she's loyal, she's obedient to a fault, she's brave and courageous yet cautious, she's faithful both to Naomi and her family and to God, she's loving, and she's kind. She's also willing to listen to her mom, well, not in the beginning, but in the end. But number three, God uses you. So God uses common, cleansed people. God uses courageous, cautious people. God uses you. Will you be a faithful friend? What can we learn from Ruth and Naomi? We might learn all of these great qualities on how to be a friend. We might also learn about how God uses common people. God uses courageous people. But we also learn that God uses you. God wants to use you. God delights to use you. And I want my daughters, I want my son to know this. And I, I want all of you to know this as well. I, I hope that all of you will also take this message to your sons, to your daughters, to your neighbors, to your friends. You need to let everybody know that God wants to use you. But you need to be faithful to him. You need to be cleansed. You need to be a believer in him. No, none are righteous, not one. It's only through Christ Jesus that our sins are washed away. Profess with your mouth that he is Lord. God uses ordinary people to do his extraordinary purposes all the time. We need people to stand beside us, and we need to stand beside other people, too. 
God used Ruth and God will use you. Now, why is this so huge? I didn't really give you that number two. I told you God uses faithful people, a faithful friend for two things. One, to obviously just be a friend. But two, <clears throat> what was God's purpose besides being a friend? Ruth's life up to this point has been full of tragedy of losing her husband. Having to go on this great journey across 75 miles, hiking up and down hills, ascents, descents. And yet, what does Ruth do? Ruth continues on and on to make this choice to stay with Naomi. And because Ruth puts her trust in God and as a faithful friend to Naomi and followed Naomi on this journey, God chooses to bless her through a new marriage with Boaz. Something that Naomi told, told her, do not come with me. I have no, no sons for you. You have no future with me. And yet because she was a faithful friend, because she was a faithful person to say, your family will be my family. Your God is my God. God blesses her with a new marriage, a new son. And listen to this. This son, Obed, would ultimately lead to Ruth being the great-grandmother of King David. Now, get this. King David is in the lineage of Christ. So we, we go back to the beginning. Ruth, a common person, a Moabite, somebody who God's people would look down upon. Because of being a faithful friend, having faith in God, is now put in the lineage, the beautiful genealogy of Jesus Christ himself. Faith is an action word. It's something you do and it's something you express. What are you doing with your life, with your friends and with your God? What are you expressing with your life? Are you expressing faith? Because that's what Ruth did. She expressed faith every step of the way. God gave us a mission, a mission to go out into all the world, to show our faith, to be men and women of action, and to spread the gospel, to be faithful friends to all people. Are we being faithful friends? Ruth did not abandon Naomi when she could have. Don't abandon the world. Help the world. Show them the love of Christ. Be a faithful friend to all God's people. Ruth's simple act of loyalty to be, to be a faithful friend was part of God's grand plan to use common, courageous people, everyday people, to be part of his purposes. All this due to a faithful friend who would not leave her friend to be alone. <clears throat> you can be that friend. You just need to not abandon God. Not abandon the people that God places in your life. God wants to use you. God wants to use common, courageous people. God wants a faithful friend to befriend the whole world. Spread the news. Be a faithful friend and be used for his purpose. Let me pray. And as I pray, you're dismissed. You're, we're closed with this. Lord God, we thank you for this day, this day that you've given us to come together and to worship you. And Lord, I thank you for the life of Ruth, for a faithful friend who committed her life, not just to her friend, but to you, as she said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And Lord, because of this commitment that she had to be a faithful friend and to not take the easy way out, but take the hard way, you decided to bless her with a new life, a new marriage to Boaz, a new child, a child. And Lord, to be part of your plan for the lineage of Jesus Christ, to be the great-grandmother of King David. Lord, we look to devote our lives to you, and as we song, sung that song at the beginning of the sermon, O oh, come to the altar, we lay our lives at your feet at the altar. Lord, may it be a humbling offering to you. Lord, use us. And we know that might put us in hard situations, but we know that it doesn't matter because we serve a mighty God. May we be courageous yet cautious as we listen to you to guide, the path, to guide our ways and not depend on our own ways. And you're holy and powerful.